Hey, it's me, Cupid. Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and maybe you're trying to think of some cute date ideas where you could also maybe save a buck or two. Well, I've got an idea for you. Why don't you just tell your loved one to come on over to your place? You can light some candles, set the mood, and have a nice romantic evening just sitting and listening to an episode of this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First and foremost, the Europe tour is happening. The prophecy is fulfilled. I've got dates pretty much set in stone for the most part. I'm in the process of sending deposits and making things 100% official. But as long as everything goes according to plan, these should be the dates. And you can always confirm things if you go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live. When the ticket sales are live, that's when it's 100% legit. So hopefully that will be happening soon. I'm doing Potterless Live. I'm doing the new Olympian Live as well. Sometimes it'll be just one podcast as a show, and then I'll be there on back-to-back nights. Sometimes it'll be a combo show where one act is the new Olympian and one act is Potterless. And some nights it's double bill. You got a TNO show, and then later you got a Potterless show. You can come to both. You can come to one. I'm trying to make as many shows as I can have happen, and this is what the tour routing is looking like. Dublin on March 7th, London March 9th and March 10th, Amsterdam March 13th and March 14th, Copenhagen, two shows in the same night, March 19th, Oslo, two shows in the same night, March 21st, Helsinki on March 29th and 30th, Berlin on April 2nd, and Munich on April 4th. The Germany dates are currently the most question marky. The other ones, I'm pretty set in those happening. But again, things aren't 100% set in stone, so don't necessarily quote me on it, but just like earmark it if you're considering it. And if you follow Potterless on social media, we're at PotterlessPod on Twitter and at PotterlessPodcast on Instagram. I will, of course, post as many updates as I can, and I might even post something on the feed here once things are 100% official. But that's what we're looking at. I tried to go to as many cities I could in the time that we will be there. I just looked at Potterless download numbers and gave preference to cities where I have the most downloads. So I was just trying to make as many people happy as possible. I hope that you are able to come through. I understand if you're not able to, if I'm not in a city or country near you, I would love to return to Europe and do another tour where I go to places I wasn't able to hit this time around. But I tried to do my best. I tried to spread the love and I tried to go to the places where the most Potterless listeners live. So that's what we've got going on. I'm very excited to make it happen and just follow us on social media and check the website potterlesspodcast.com slash live for when things are official. Now, outside of Europe, we also have US shows. If you live in California, I will be coming your way in February. We've got a show in San Diego on February 20th that's going to be a half Potterless, half the New Olympian show. We've got a two shows, one night situation in Los Angeles on February 21st, where there's an eight o'clock, the New Olympian show and a 10 o'clock Potterless show. And then on February 23rd, I'll be in San Francisco doing a half Potterless, half the New Olympian show. If you want to get to that, you can and also go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live, especially for the LA show. You might want to go quickly because tickets are selling quick and the venue isn't huge, but you do get a discount if you buy tickets at both shows. So that's super fun. Now, what's going on in this episode in particular? This is a live show that we did in June of 2022 in Chicago with Eric Skull of MuggleCast. Such a fun show. Absolutely fantastic. We did also stream the show, but something went wrong with the stream where the first 30 minutes or so of the video did not work. If you want to see the remaining minutes of that video, you can go to the Potterless YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Potterless, and you can watch there. It doesn't have the entire thing, so you might want to listen to the first 30 minutes or so of this. But if you wanted to see what the show looked like, even though there's some weird lighting stuff that makes our faces look weird because there was like pink and purple stage lighting, regardless, if you want to see and not just hear the episode, check it out on YouTube. But without further ado, let's get into this episode where Eric Skull and I do the Hangry Games, where we put some Harry Potter characters through the gauntlet of a Battle Royale Hungry Games style tournament live in Chicago. Please welcome to the stage, Mike Schubert from Potterless. I got the juice, I got the juice, 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 Chicago, how's it going? You know it's a good intro when I dance so much that the batteries fly out of the money gun. (laughs) And only 10% of the pretend dollars fly out. That's how much I love you all. How's it going, everybody? (laughs) Woo! It is a joy to be back here in Chicago and then also streaming on the internet everywhere. If you're in the live stream, make some noise. Wow, you screamed in your living room. (laughs) So I'm very excited to be back. I was here last summer and it was a very fun time. Let me just say, 
I've become a changed man since my last time in Chicago, mainly in that I learned that Portillo's is not a Mexican chain called Portillo's, <laughs> and they sell hot dogs. And I also have consumed Malort. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting experience, to say the least. Unfortunately, didn't have any today, darn. <laughs> Little too early for the brunch show. I don't know if some malort at the crack of noon is a good idea. If you're not from Chicago and you're watching the stream at home and you're like, what's going on? You're best not knowing. <laughs> but I'm very excited to be here on Father's Day. Shout out to my dad, Joel P. Schubert, who I believe is watching at home. And shout out to any other dad, thank you. Shout out to any other dads or anyone that just wants to use this as an excuse. You know, you got a plant. Yeah, you're a plant dad. Happy Father's Day, you've done it. So today we are going to be doing something very special for the brunch show. We are going to be doing a very important endeavor called the Hangry Games, where I will be joined by a very special guest that I'm about to bring out. And we'll be putting some Harry Potter dynamic duos into a battle royale style tournament. Obviously, I cannot do this alone. I need someone to help me make these tough decisions about who would be eliminated and who will go on to the next round. So please, welcome to the stage, Eric Skull from MuggleCast. Eric, come on out. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I believe you have to turn the mic on. <laughs> Is this real money? <laughs> it is not. It is pretend, but it looks convincing. Isn't that fun? We obviously have mimosas for the brunch show. And they don't have Malort in them. No, they don't. Is that a thing? Like, can you get like a Malortza? I something? would absolutely not. Part of me was like, when I was booking the show, I was like, wouldn't it be fun if I made a Malort mimosa? And then I was like, oh man, then I'd have to buy a whole thing of Malort. That would be a lot. So you have experience with both Harry Potter and the Hunger Games, right? So I've clearly picked the most perfect guest possible. <laughs> yeah, I've read the books and saw the movies and love it. And you've been Harry Potter podcasting for how many years now? Since 2005. Okay, which was 17 years ago. MuggleCast was the first Harry Potter podcast out there. Ooh, and Potterless yeah. was not. <laughs> <laughs> that said, it's been an amazing journey in watching new podcasts come and occupy the sphere and do amazing things. That's so sweet of you. So, and I'll pay you backstage for yeah, saying yeah. Such, such nice no, things. We, we, we've done conventions before. We've we been have. at LeakyCon together, mm -hmm, LeakyCon, mm -hmm. and uh, done a few live podcasting panels and stuff. So I was thrilled when you reached out and said, hey, I'm going to be in Chicago. Come be a guest. Well, I'm very excited for this very serious thing that we're doing today. So uh, if we can get the screen projector stuff on and going, then, oh, yeah, here we are. The Hangry Games. Look at us go. I Googled your name and found this photo on Google Images. Yep. Yeah. That actually is the promo photo I'm using for live events right now. Let's so that, go. I picked so well. That was lucky. <laughs> that was very lucky. So uh, the main reason we've got the presentation here is because we have the teams. Now, if anyone hasn't read The Hunger Games, don't worry, because this is incredibly loosely based on The Hunger Games which Kelly made sure I should point out because when I explained the idea to her last night, she was like, this is so barely The Hunger Games. <laughs> okay, so don't worry. But basically, in The Hunger Games, they're in the post-apocalyptic world of Pan Am, and there's all these different districts. They have to compete in this big old tournament to, I don't know, impress rich people. Doesn't really matter. It's a, capitalism's bad. You know, cool, great, the book. Now, we have these teams taking the place of districts. So what I've got here, all of these are dynamic duos or pairings that I've put together and labeled as a dynamic duo. And here are the groups and the districts, because in Hunger Games, they've each got little districts, like ones like they do coal. I'm very right. impressed that you actually came up with districts for each of these pairings. Yes, and I definitely put lots of thought into it and didn't just think of the first joke that popped into my head. Now, let it be clear that if I am using my phone here, it's because there's certain information about the show that I want to keep a surprise from Eric. I'm not, like, texting while performing. <laughs> yeah, you built in challenges, and they're going to face, like, mm -hmm. dangers. It's real cool. It's going to be much fun. like the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. So here are the districts of people, and the visual aid, as you can see, has the teams. Also, these are have no representation for the actual Hunger Game districts, because I don't remember any of them, except for, like... No, I really did. Katniss is from 12, and they make like rocks. Did, like, no idea. So, the first district, just going in order, we've got Harry and Ron. They are from the Rock Quarry District because they are as dense as rocks. We have Fred and George from the Practical Joke District. 
We have Neville and Luna from the Plants and Pets District, AKA the Millennial District. <laughs> we have Crab and Goyle from the Lumber District because they're kind of, you know, big meat bro heads. We've got Draco and Lucius Malfoy from the Luxury Furniture District. We have Hermione and Ginny from the Literature District. We've got Voldemort and Pettigrew from the Theater slash Theatrics District. <laughs> Dumbledore and Kingsley from the Fashion District. Hagrid and Buckbeak from the Produce District, all sorts of food. Sirius and Lupin from the Chocolate District. Lee Jordan and McGonagall from the Sports Equipment District. Dobby and Winky from the Socks District. And Arthur and Molly from the Home Goods District. <laughs> Here are all the photos here. I went with some silly, goofier ones, you know, like instead of Neville, we've got shirtless Matt Lewis. So the true representation of all the characters that we all love. We have all of these different districts. They've been put into the tournament. Now, before we get into the actual hecticness of the tournament, what happens, at least in the first Hunger Games book, is there's all of this pageantry and pomp and circumstance to welcome in the different contestants. They do kind of like a fashion show. They do an interview. In the movie, the interview is with Stanley Tucci, which is great. Just love the Tucci. Uh, Tucci could not be reached uh, for Couldn't, appearance on yeah. the show. Unfortunately, he was busy with his show where he just goes around Italy and eats food and gets paid money to do it? <laughs> Fuck, I gotta get on that Stanley Tucci money. This is pretty good. But if I just like eat food in Italy and it's like, now you're a TV show. Wow, Stanley, you've done it. I would watch a show that's you doing that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Honestly, the Stanley Tucci show is so good. It's so nice. <laughs> it's really great. They're not paying me to say this. Come on, CNN Plus, which doesn't exist anymore. Pay me money! <laughs> anyway, they do an interview with that. Obviously, the interview in this case, the person in charge of magical sports and games, we all know him and love him, Ludo Bagman. He does the interviews. He's a great character that definitely mattered in the grand scheme of things in the series. He was very important. Before we get into who we think would do well in the challenge, is there anyone you think would interview well or do well in the pageantry and the fashion show of it all? Well, I'm excited to see what Lucius and Draco pull right. out with the luxury yeah. furniture mm -hmm. district. That's it's a very important export. I get Instagram ads for couches that I cannot afford all the time. <laughs> but they can afford them. They can afford them, and they make them, and that's the exporting district. Yeah, they would, I feel, do very well in an interview. I feel like Fred and George would do very poorly in the interview because they would just be messing with the interviewers, just like the actual Phelps twins do yeah. during interviews. But they would make a bang. They would very easily buy in, you know, a large group of the crowd would be like, oh yeah, these guys, these guys are great. Yeah, they'd be fan favorites for sure. But yeah. maybe not because part of the interviews in the Hunger Games, you have to like impress the sponsors and then they oh, send yeah. you gifts and things. Well, you know, like, so Katniss in one of the movies has the dress that catches, like literally, literally. catches fire or transforms her into the Mockingjay, mm -hmm. all these other things. Mm -hmm. Well... I bet that Fred and George would have some kind of similar visual Ooh, flair. Very going fun. On. Yes. You know. That's very fun. Especially, uh, you could also have some fun theatrics with the team of Lupin and Sirius. They could turn into their dog oh. slash werewolf forms. Well, Lupin's going to have to be very careful if he does that. <laughs> That's very true. It would have to be very much <laughs> planned and under wraps. Yeah, I, I think there's some good ones. I think Hagrid and Buckbeak could make a cool entrance. Maybe he flies in on Buckbeak. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. The photo that I've used for Buckbeak, I'm is, it's the Buckbeak from the roller coaster, which is terrifying. Not the coaster, <laughs> but the it. Buckbeak. He's it, like very like, thanks for coming on my ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing this Hagrid, though, flying in on Buckbeak. Yeah. Going, oh, God. <laughs> PlayStation 1 pixelated Hagrid is the one true Hagrid. <laughs> You've definitely gotten to the core of these characters with these images. Really there. to the soul. So we've got all this going on. The interviews take place. Things are great. But then the actual tournament takes place. So in the Hunger Games, they're in like this big outdoor-ish arena. I think like they think they're outdoors, but there actually is a roof it's, thing yeah, you learn. Like Spoiler alert, I guess, in terms of Hunger Games, those movies have been out forever. You could have watched it. But what we do here is we've got all of the characters, their teams, they're in, they're getting ready to go. Now, a key difference that we're going to have here versus the Hunger Games. In the Hunger Games, everybody murders each other. We're not going to do that here because I don't think a fun Sunday afternoon for everyone would be an hour and a half of us murdering your favorite Harry Potter characters. <laughs> so instead, we're going to go by Percy Jackson rules when they fight the monsters, which is like if you take a significant enough blow, you kind of disappear away. So people aren't going to die. They're just going to get like poofed out of there. It's magic. They could make it happen. And honestly, maybe they should have in the Triviser tournament. Like, how did they not do anything? How did kids die? Come on. <laughs> Listen. You need stakes, man. <laughs> that's true, that's true. 
So no one's going to die. That's the first key difference. The other difference in the Hunger Games, all the teams are boy and girl, but it's 2022, so who cares? So <laughs> there's some teams like, we have Hagrid and Buckbeak as a team. Clearly, I went fast and loose with the pairings. <laughs> And it doesn't matter <laughs> about that. So the only other difference here is that in the Hunger Games, first, it's like every person for themselves. But then they switch the rules where it's like, if you're from the same district, you can win together. And then, spoiler alert, they like change the rules again back to the original one to try to spike the drama. Not doing that here. It's just the teams going after each other so that we don't have to have like Draco kill his dad. <laughs> so it's all going to be the teams of two sticking together. And what we're going to have happen is each round, some sort of event is going to take place. Like the gamesmen do something that is a task that everyone's going to overcome. One of these pairings isn't going to make it and we'll move on to the next round. We'll do a bunch in act one, break a little intermission, do some more. Now what we've got to do this is I've created some magical obstacles and I also have two dice <laughs> Ooh, I stole them from my friend Patrick's place. I'm staying at his place and he had this at his coffee table and I knew I needed dice. So shout out Patrick for your dice. I'll give them back. I promise. I so, love those dice. Those are like the big dice that you get in Vegas. Yeah, big old dice. You know, a good old D12, the classic one. Now, I'm going to roll a die and we'll see what magical, terrifying thing takes place. Oh and then you have no idea what these are, which no. is fun. I know what they are, but we'll see what the first magical thing they have to deal with is. I've rolled a 10. Okay, oh great, this is a good one to start. <clears throat> They're all in the field. They're getting prepared. And out from the sky flies in a Chinese fireball dragon and it starts attacking. Everybody has to deal with the dragon attack. From the groups here, which is everybody, who do we think does well in a dragon attack? Who do we think is not gonna do well in a big old dragon attack? Hagrid's got it covered. Hagrid's good, great. Hagrid's safe. Feel like Harry, he's seen this before. He's done this in the Trivizer tournament. At the very least, he'd be fast enough on a broom. Mm -hmm. He'd help mm -hmm. Ron along. Right. I think they would escape without maybe even being singed. Yeah, he'll be okay. Fred and George broom-wise, I think they'll be okay. Crab and Goyle, they gonna be okay? <laughs> a resounding no from everyone in the crowd. <laughs> Especially considering they're from a different district or on a different team than Draco, their leader. Right. Without that direction, without any direction, they might survive, but it won't be pretty. No, it wouldn't be pretty. We saw how well things went for Crab when Fiendfire got in the mix, which was to say, not very well at all. <laughs> Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly is. I can't believe it. Uh, weirdly, everyone else I've picked either is good at flying or they can do well with creatures. Like Luna, we don't see on a broom, but I feel like she's going to be like friends with the dragon by the end of this. Yeah. Like they'll, they're going to like have tea afterwards. The, the dragon's going to tell her all about its dad. Yeah, yes. they'll, they'll get all along well. I feel like everybody else can hold their own. I do feel like Crab and Goyle are probably the least fit. Yeah, you, I mean, you make a great point about Fiend Fire. Like, fire is the end of one of these guys canonically. So yeah, okay. I mean, I feel like well, in that case, everyone's favorite dynamic duo, Crab and Goyle, oh. do not survive the first round. <laughs> What's that? Oh, everyone's leaving. No! <laughs> it's all good. So they have been removed. The odds were not in their favor. No, they weren't. Ha-ha! <laughs> I totally forgot that was a thing, so I'm glad you made that joke so we didn't do a Hunger Games thing and not make the one reference. Do, 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 do. Okay. There you go. We'll now do, roll. Do, 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 do. What is that? We're doing the... Oh, the oh I, I, do they whistle back and forth? Does she like hold up three fingers? I've clearly read these books a lot. Wow. Okay. Let's not do it any more time so that no, 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 no. Suzanne Collins doesn't sue us. Oh, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> there's there's going to be that content warning on YouTube now. We'll be right, monetized. Yeah. The live stream is just shut down everywhere. Oh, They're like, God. no, no. <laughs> it wasn't that good a whistle. I could probably do better. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Now let's see what the next thing we have to deal with is. Okay. We've rolled a four. Oh, okay, great. This will show like the full range of <laughs> clear oh, things I've put. So something that happens in the Hunger Games is they use like fire or other sort of natural disasters to kind of force people into one place. So we have here now, everyone has been forced with various either fire, wind, whatever, to one big area. They get into this big open field and they notice in the grass, it's cut kind of like how they do baseball off fields where it's like different patches, like dark green, light green, dark green, light green, dark green, light green. And it's a big square. And then on the square, are giant wizard's chess pieces <laughs> with blank spots. So the remaining contestants all take over for a spot in wizard's chess. Okay. 
who do we think would do well in a game of Wizard's Chess besides Ron Weasley? <laughs> well, <laughs> here's an important question. Mm -hmm. What year of their lives are each of these characters in? Is there a fixed point in time where we can say... I say let's, they'll all be like year seven, or I guess up until the point where the books end or they die. <laughs> so like, okay, so the very five serious. <laughs> the very last day of their lives. Yes, uh, that we okay. know of, not 19 years later though, or Cursed Child, because neither of those exist. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, well I think Ron Weasley, like, again, it's, the whole him being good at chess thing is amazing, mm -hmm. and he's like such a strategic thinker, and he's yeah. really set mm -hmm. up well as like this mm -hmm. great part of the trio, and is it never comes back, right? Ever really again, <laughs> his whole strategic mind. I'd like to believe he retains it. It's just not you know no real opportunity to show it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, Ron is safe. We yeah. already kind of knew mm -hmm. that. Ron is safe. I feel like the Malfoys would be good at chess. Like it just feels like a fancy thing that Lucius would make. Draco learn at like age five. They have like a diamond chess set. Ooh, you know, yeah. At, that I would be home. terrified to play because if you like drop a piece, it would break. Yeah, yeah or mm -hmm. cut you. It right. would be like a hard, like oh, a hard yeah. diamond. Just ow. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. yeah. Yeah, not great. Just sitting in their foyer. Mm -hmm. And then Dobby had to dust it all the time. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like McGonagall would be very good at chess. Yeah. I feel like Dumbledore, smart, fancy, good at chess. I don't know if Hagrid knows how to play chess. <laughs> This and is would he just only move the knight piece because it's the horse? Like, would he just be like, wow, this is very fun. <laughs> Look at it, hop around, up one, over two, yay. Now I would love to see Hagrid on Buckbeak as a knight character that would in be, like a live ooh, wizard's chess. I never would have thought, right? they need to come up with a new Harry Potter wizard's chess set. <laughs> Where it's Hagrid on top yeah, of Buckbeak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, hard to see a weak spot, but I think you might have found, I don't want to see Hagrid go down this early. Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously Dobby would know because he has to dust it, so he learns how to play. Dobby knows how to play. He yeah, knows yeah. how to play. Voldemort knows how to play. Ginny would probably know. I feel like the Weasleys know different games and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah unfortunately, yeah. I like Buckbeak for sure doesn't know how to play. <laughs> I don't think Buckbeak can. You don't know that. Pieces. You don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's in the pumpkin patch. He had like a starter set of chess, and he's like, <laughs> it's all. Like, well, it's, I'm here until the book says I'm not. It's all. It. <laughs> It's all like vegetables and produce. Like yeah. All the pawns are the pumpkins. The gourds are just there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rook is a uh, squash. Buckbeak <laughs> is actually a grandmaster at chess. <laughs> it just never came up. Right, yeah. So I think, I think unfortunately, Hagrid and Buckbeak oh, are, are going to go. I know. Pixelated Hagrid. Pixelated Hagrid and scary plastic animatronic Buckbeak. Oh, no. I love that thing. Can I just say you're on the, you're on the roller coaster at the Wizarding World in Florida <laughs> and it like bows to you like. Right. It just also has demon eyes while it bows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's true. Fair call. Fair call. <laughs> okay. So we've got two tasks down, and we continue. What did we roll? Okay. We've rolled a six. Okay, great. Another classic one. They're in the forest, and they're all trying to hide out, camp out from each other, get ready, prepare for the next attack. And all of the sudden, a man, for some reason wearing a turban, runs in, <laughs> and he screams, Trolls in the area! <laughs> And it's an infestation of trolls in the forest. I know there's multiple type of trolls, so why not? It's all the trolls, mountain, forest, bathroom, all the type of trolls. <laughs> in a troll attack, who do we think would fare well? Who would not fare well? It's a shame we got rid of Hagrid. I know, would have been great. Could have been best friends with him. He could have helped out all his friends too. You know, yeah. I think that's one of those uh, situations where the districts would work together against a common larger mm -hmm. threat. Right, you, there are alliances that do take place. So if some of these groups want to team up, they could. Maybe we get a reuniting of the trio with Harry, Ron, and Hermione since they have tackled a troll before. Maybe they do it a little less haphazardly yeah. as they did the first time around, but I feel like those three at least would be pretty well suited to conquer a troll attack. Dobby and Winky are safe. Yeah, uh, they're good. That's a theme we're gonna have, I think, coming up, is that house elf magic is right. rumored to be at least very, very, very powerful. Yeah, they can just be like, and just bounce. <laughs> yeah. Have fun, guys, later. No, totally. <laughs> Molly and Arthur, I was gonna say pretty much everybody that's been through school could probably at least handle a troll. Right, right. So and we're I, looking at the students there, yeah. like what even? Mm. Yeah, because now we're gonna be in an interesting spot here. As far as like powerful wizards, I feel like Voldemort's gonna be just fine. Dumbledore and Kingsley are gonna be just fine. They'll have the style. Remus and Sirius are gonna be okay. Again, trolls, I feel like Luna could be set. The one I'm a little worried, are Molly and Arthur gonna be okay? I love them. But the only like true, 
I guess we see like Molly be really good here. They do the big defense spells. She says, not my daughter, you bitch to Bellatrix, which is very cool. Yeah, yeah. But we don't see like as much like action scene stuff with them. But I feel like some of the other people off like, I think McGonagall's going to be fine. She holds herself well in a duel against Snape. It's a tough one. I think that if Molly and Arthur were to go down in this round, it would be during an act of protection for oh, one of their kids. Oh, how many how many kids yeah. do they have in this game? They Jay's got a there, lot. They Ron's got there. Fred and George are all there. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say that would be a situation where, again, they're not dying. So right. thank yeah. God. Right, right. Thank you for changing those rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you know, like, like maybe this. the troll, as not smart as trolls are, mm-hmm. um, maybe that they would uh, still nevertheless get the upper hand somehow. Mm-hmm. They are still a big giant hole monster yeah, with a yeah, very yeah. large club. I think one of the children, uh, one of the Weasley kids would be, you know, trapped unexpectedly or something and they'd need to get in there. That's and great. A heartfelt moment. Take one for the team. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, that happens in the Hunger Games. You have some, like, groups working together and tributes happening. So, okay, yeah. I think that's really nice and sweet and they're just going out with style to protect their, yeah. you know, all of the important children. They were never in it to here. win it. They were just, you know, there to support. Yes. Okay, well... Sad to see them go. That's but. the last time we can ever pull that heartwarming <laughs> shit. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Like, All right. Okay. We're, we're, we're whittling it down, and we're going to continue along and see what our next challenge is. Okay. I've already rolled that number before, so I'll roll again. Ooh. Okay. Here's a very fun one. So. Again, all the people are getting ready. What's the next task? What's going to happen? And all of a sudden, in the distance... They hear a very faint. <laughs> and then in flies Super Mario? Yes. <laughs> Woohoo! In flies a jester. <laughs> All dressed in jester garb. And it's Peeve the Poltergeist doing various pranks. Oh my god. These folks now have to survive an onslaught of pranks from Peeves the Poltergeist, criminally not ever seen in the Harry Potter movies. Obviously, Fred and George are just fine. They're fine. <laughs> if anything, they start helping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, if these teams have to battle Peeves the Poltergeist and Fred and George mm-hmm. teaming up. Right, right, right. Okay, all right. That helps. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. You just never know. Peeves is so unpredictable. Like his mm-hmm. jokes that he thinks are funny aren't necessarily funny, but he could still do some damage if he was really trained. He mm-hmm. throws things at people's heads all the time. I think that's what's going to happen. I feel like for any of the things, like maybe you get hit with a water balloon and it's not a big deal, or you like step on a whoopee cushion and he laughs. But if someone's going to get eliminated from this round, he's going to like drop an actual anvil yeah. down and be like, yeah. ha ha, I saw this or on like a Muggle a TV show. Or something. Right. You know, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. shame Filch and Mrs. Norris aren't playing. Oh. Right? I'd be like, this is a perfect <laughs> They'd time be out to take immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not well suited. Uh, hmm. I, you know, weirdly, I don't know that Draco and Lucius would fare well against it because I feel like they'd be like weirdly yelling at him. Yeah. Like, they'd be like, how dare you ruin the integrity of the game yeah. with these stink bombs. I think Lucius would be like personally offended by Peeves' existence and right. spend yeah. all time mm-hmm. just being like, you shouldn't exist. And yeah. Don't you know who I am? And mm-hmm. And Drake will just be like, I'm going to tell my dad about this. Right. Oh, he's right here, but I'm going to tell him. He's right here. I'm going to tell him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like, yeah, I think that's a good, I feel like everybody would hold their own. They either have experience with peeves or with pranks and all that kind of stuff. But I think Draco, I mean, Draco doesn't do well with, I mean, he got turned into a ferret and just absolutely got his shit wrecked by Moody. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, the recovery time's a little slower for him on pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like Harry in that, you know, when in a duel, he's only as good as he can think to be, Mm -hmm. and it just doesn't come up as often as it does for Harry, so, Mm -hmm. yeah. And he doesn't doesn't thrive in, like, a silly nature. Like, Draco needs structure and the ability to say that his father will hear about this, so. Yeah, I agree. He wouldn't hold with any nonsense. Yeah. And would be kind of unmoored by it. Yeah, he'd be shaken. So I'm going to say Draco and Lucius, unfortunately, gone. But what would the world be like without luxury furniture? You know, the district is still pushing it out. And we can all, you know, when we try to get past Ikea, and you're like, what do couches cost outside of Ikea? And you go, what? (laughs) (laughs) That's too many commas. (laughs) So we've lost home goods. Oh, should we do that thing at the end of uh, the the night where the 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 cannon goes off? Fireworks in the shape of whatever their major export is. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've lost home goods, Molly and Arthur. (laughs) 
Yes. We've lost uh, luxury furniture mm-hmm. in Lucius and Draco. Right. We've lost lumber in Crab and Goyle. The big loss. <laughs> big loss. <laughs> we lost produce in Hagrid and Buckbeak. Which Why is... were they produce? I have to ask. I just, well, I was trying to... Hagrid, he like he makes cakes. He's got dragon meat and stuff. He's got the pumpkin patch. Cakes. Okay, yeah, yeah he has right. a garden. He's, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Don't like food. So the only food left is Sirius and Lupin with chocolate. So, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. Okay. We do have things we can eat, but it's okay. The districts aren't gone. Just their representatives are yeah, now teleported yeah, yeah, to the yeah, audience. Yeah, 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 so yeah. it's okay. It's okay. All right. So we're going to continue on and see what the next challenge holds for us. Oh, okay. Again, all the people waiting to see what's next. They start to hear some fluttering, like the fluttering of wings. But it's not big, flappy, floopy wings. So it's not a Thestral or a bony pony. It's tiny, little, annoying wings, and it's a lot of them. And in flies, much to the dismay of Gildoray Lockhart, watching at home, (laughs) bragging about how he's totally vanquished these beasts before, and it's definitely been okay, and it didn't go all horribly wrong. It's a pixie infestation, and they all start flying in all creepy. Like, I don't know if anybody played the Harry Potter Pokemon Go game, the Wizards Unite one. Right. You have to fight a lot of pixies, not pretty creatures to deal with. There were many reasons why I stopped playing that game after roughly one day. But the amount of, like, angry pixies going like, meh, all the time, pretty high on the list of why that game are you pulling it up do you still have that on your phone no, no, uh, okay no. Oh, no. <laughs> I was say, i'm not checking Howard into my <laughs> local wizards uh, that actually closed recently oh they actually shut the game down or yeah, oh, wow. yeah the server stopped because it was not uh, and well traveled. no did anyone stick with it was anyone playing resounding silence from the audience <laughs> That's a shame. I liked, again, I liked the art style. I thought it was going to be great. I loved Pokemon Go. Remember how the world was perfect during Pokemon Go and it has only gotten worse since? Yeah. Like, it's only gone downhill from Pokemon Go. Like, 2016, just all bad. (laughs) It's just, no. The glory days when, like, the biggest thing we had to complain about was people, like, crossing the street like this <laughs> on their phone, not looking both ways. That was the biggest gripe we had. Jeepers, creepers, I miss it. Anyway, pixies are all here. How do we think people are going to fare against pixies? We haven't yet really talked about Voldemort or Peter Pettigrew at all. No, we have not. And if an 11-year-old can take them down, uh-huh. Ooh. a 13-year-old or 12-year-old, <laughs> maybe they aren't hot shit. Maybe mm-hmm. Peter Pettigrew would either drag Voldemort down, they'd be distracted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't trust Peter Pettigrew to really hold his own in like a high stress situation. Yeah. Voldemort, what's interesting is that we only ever see him fight people one-on-one and even when he does, not a great track record. Because like at best, (laughs) he ties Harry in book four and he very much loses to Harry in book seven. What you said made me think, you know, he's always crying, Avada Kedavra. <laughs> There's too many pixies. In the time, right, in the time he's getting those words out, five pixies could have him up by the ears. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Avada, you know, just right. completely destroyed. Right, and, and he doesn't take really part in the Hogwarts battle, battle of Hogwarts party. He's kind of off on his own, yeah. menacing, going all Amber Alert and infiltrating everybody's ears at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, yeah, group like hectic situation, he might not do very well. He likes particular situations that he set up. Like the duel for Harry was like, he basically like planned an entire party. Like he set up, what's an ominous location? Oh yeah, I'll do the port key thing. I'll have all of my people stand around in a circle, but they can't interfere. Yeah, he didn't have a year to plan this, so that would be a thing. Also, yeah. this would be a situation where you're like, really, Voldemort down by pixies? What are you guys thinking? But I'm thinking, like, the other teams would all have funneled the pixies there. They would have figured mm-hmm. out a way to right. team up because mm-hmm. Voldemort's pretty obviously bad. Pretty obviously yeah. he shouldn't win this. Right. So they got to work together. I think the other teams would have kind of made it so that that would have been hell. I also like that thought because at this point, this could be where the teams all work together and everyone realizes, hey, we're all good guys left except for Voldemort <laughs> and Peter Pettigrew. Like, this is Sirius's chance to finally get revenge after his 12 years of waiting. Oh, yeah. So maybe they all team together and they do kind of like how Nagini was in the super monkey ball and then they put that over <laughs> Snape's head and then it was just like a Nagini attack. Maybe they do some sort of spell where they like, they trap Voldemort and Pettigrew inside of a magic 
magical sphere and then they get all the pixies in there and then it's just like attack zone and everybody else is safe and they're all just like watching Fred and George like get popcorn, you know. <laughs> Plus, if anybody's ever going to be annoyed to death, it's Voldemort. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. yep, I correct. can't handle this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Rookwood. <laughs> so... Okay, <laughs> big Rookwood fan in the front. <laughs> so, okay, they they are gone. The Pixie Swarm is the undoing of the greatest dark wizard of all time. I love it. It's, ne- it's never what you'd expect. Right, yeah. Right? Like yeah. a disarming charm yeah. kills him. Exactly, like, it's perfect, yeah. it's perfect. Pixies. Okay, all right, party roll that number. I, I should have it, there we go, great. Oh, cool, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a fun one. The contestants go back hiding in the forest. And let's say, like, night falls because the magical gamesmen can change the setting. So it's nighttime. We hear some owls and, and different night, you know, crickets and magical lightning bugs because they have those. It's nice and quiet. People are trying to see what's going on. And then you just see a bright light come from one side and then a bright light from another side. And then there's more bright lights and more bright lights. And then in unison, you hear a really loud horn noise. And what flies in but a bunch of evil Ford Anglias. <laughs> it is an infestation of the Weasley's flying car. And much like Cars the movie from Disney, the headlights look like eyes and the grills look like mouth. And it's all angry eyed, evil looking Ford Anglias. And they're here on the attack. This may be my favorite <laughs> challenge that I've. How, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Evil Fort Anglias. Evil Fort Anglias Multiple. have attacked lots of them. It's a swarm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, okay. obviously, Fred and George gonna be just fine. Well, they have some experience with the Fort right, Anglias right, right. more than anybody else, you know. And and Ron and Harry could maybe, but maybe they didn't do great with the Fort Anglia. They had no. a tough run and then a good run when they were running away with the Fort Anglia. But they've had their history. Ginny's good on a broom. She could outfly it or work some stuff. Right. Uh, Hermione's not good on a broom. Could be very supportive. It's true. It's true. Um, hmm. Here's an interesting thing. The car is not a magical creature. And the car is not a giant snake. So I think Neville and Luna are at a disadvantage here. I know. I love them too. (laughs) That's what makes this hard. It only gets harder. (laughs) As far as like expertise there, might not be okay with the flying car situation. Is this the to the only pairing of wizard-born people, like exclusively wizard-born people? Maybe, yeah. I'm trying to think who would get their driver's test and actually yeah. pass a, a That's car true. thing. That's yeah. like Hermione could do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our parents would even take her out for like the test drives that you right. do. The other thing that you can consider, though, if we want to look at another group, is that car is definitely a muggle thing, but a lot of these wizards have to deal with blending in and understanding. A lot of these people take muggle studies in Hogwarts, and maybe they teach them about cars. But... The people who don't go to class would be Winky and Dobby. No, they're okay. safe. They're safe. <laughs> I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> what about McGonagall and Lee Jordan? Hmm. Lee Jordan commentates Quidditch. Yes, he does. He is very funny. McGonagall loves Quidditch. Right. But that's all to do with brooms. Right, yeah. What and, would they do with and, this evil car? Right, and I will say, McGonagall, very good in a duel. She really handled the situation with Snape very well. Such a cool fight. Very well. But the other time we see her in a fight is when there's like a bunch of people going on and they all hit her with stupefy at the same time. And thankfully she makes it out okay, but that could be proof of not working out super well in like a group same kind of like hold Voldemort with a bunch of distraction going on as opposed to an isolated thing. Yeah. So maybe not the best. And also we don't see, do we ever see Lee Jordan do magic or does he just like pull pranks and make fun of people? <laughs> Which are great, important life no, no, skills. No, no, no. <laughs> He's awesome. It's largely mm-hmm. by association. I don't think we see him really, maybe in the battle, maybe in the final battle. He's maybe, yeah, he, he could have been an alumni like, that comes yeah, back. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But I'm I'm kind of thinking that maybe yeah maybe, okay. maybe McGonagall leaves. But this is the heartwarming like oh our you know our friend and our teacher sure. our head of house for many of these people uh, goes down and they're like oh loss and and love and tell your loved ones you love them and all mm-hmm. that stuff. So yeah. it's like a heartwarming moment of like we got to rally together we got to get through this even though it's all a battle royale and they yeah. all have to. This is the thing where like when they get eliminated so I think they're they're going to be gone when they get eliminated like all the remaining students who really love the two of them like band together and they're just like oh no like we got to do it for our favorite teacher who should have been the headmaster earlier on. <laughs> she clearly had a better hold of things over Dumbledore, who is intentionally manipulating teenagers rather than like telling them what's happening. And then also our friendly Jordan, who's very funny. <laughs> okay, so I think we're gonna do one more before we break. We'll do one final okay. little pairing, and then in Act Two, we'll see who fends off to win. I also realize I've not come up with a prize <laughs> for winning the Hunger Games. It's a good thing they're fictional characters, and they don't need to give them something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay, great. This is a fun one to end. And very thematic, given who just took place as the past attack. So we've fended off the evil Fort Anglius. Everyone is still in the woods. It's sunrise. It's the break of dawn. It's really nice. Very pretty sky out. The, the magical birds are chirping. Are there any, what's a magical bird from Fantastic Beasts and where they're located? I feel like owls are kind of magical. Okay, yeah, owls, yeah, oh, because the owls, right, there's yeah. There's a flooper, yeah. there's a yeah. swooping yeah. evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's the, the sad song. Alchemy. Line. Yeah, Alchemy, there's the, the foxes here. Yeah, maybe, maybe Hedwig is there like yelling at Harry, like, you write a letter for me to send. <laughs> birds are chirping and sassing Harry Potter. But then people are, noticing a rustling in the leaves. And it's not just a rustling in the leaves, it's a rustling in the branches. And it's not just a rustling in the branches. The entire trees are moving. Uh Uh-oh, every tree is a whomping willow and we didn't recognize this? (laughs) Everyone's in a field of whomping willows. And Ron and Harry just fought off the car and they go, not this again! Okay, two teams are safe immediately. Well, three teams, because they know the secret to the Whomping Willow. The True. Little, the little knot mm-hmm. that you gotta push to freeze it. Yes. That's, of course, Harry and Ron. Mm-hmm. Remus and Sirius. Yes. OG, they're mm-hmm. very familiar. Mm-hmm. And Hermione, by yes. association. So they're right. safe. They're safe. Can we drag? Can we clean yeah, drag at this point? Yes. Ooh, right. here we <laughs> so These guys are safe. Today's episode brought to you by Google Slides. <laughs> So they know the secret. Dumbledore probably knows the secret, and Dumbledore and Kingsley could actually probably handle a lot of Whomping Willows at once. Yes, yes. They are gargantuan guys. They are the ones to beat. Mm -hmm. Here, it does get tough. It does get tough at this point. Fred and George handed... I was just going to say, Neville, it's a plant. He's fine. Like, (laughs) Neville's like, oh, yeah, the Whomping Willow, right. Yep, uh uh-huh, totally. That's a a really good point. Yeah. (laughs) Fred and George handed Harry the map of all the exits to Hogwarts. They know of the Whomping Willow, but... but they didn't tell him... I don't think they know the thing. About the secret. Right. Right. But I'm suggesting that that was such a terrifying kind of thing that they never even approached it. They okay. did not want to oh. deal with it. This is their weak spot. This Ooh. is their kryptonite. Okay. Okay. Because they didn't even want to go there. They're like, <laughs> yeah, there's this... The secret passage and there's a, a whomping willow above it, we're not going to use that secret passage. We got 12 others. Yeah, okay. So they never come face to face with this. Right. And by the time they do, maybe maybe it's too many large willowy fists. Dang. Well, <laughs> it's okay. And, and I think what could be a fun thing is like, maybe they go out, because, you know, they're not going to die, so it's okay. They're going to go out doing what they love so that we have a nice send-off for them. And maybe... Ron, like, gets out of there okay, but maybe, as we've seen Ron with Mopping Willows, like, maybe he breaks his leg again. And maybe Fred and George are too busy making fun of Ron <laughs> that they don't see the Willow Womp just come from behind them <laughs> and just knock him clean out. They make some sort of tree-related joke. Like, you know, they say something like, oh, we wish you good luck, but we didn't mean really break your leg. <laughs> and then, boosh! <laughs> just, uh, they just get swatted by a Whomping Willow. And they get sent off, and that is unfortunately their demise. Or not demise, they just get teleported. And then, you know, they're watching, and they're, like, laughing about how silly it all was. So they're totally fine. And that's where we're going to leave it for Act 1. Oh, the stunning conclusion in Act 2. Oh, let me just pass the mic over to Editing Mike. How's it going, everybody? And now it's me, Editing Mike again, but a different Editing Mike. Thank you, past Editing Mike. Thank you, past Live Show Mike. But I am here for Wingardium at Ridosa. (laughs) 
talked about the live shows in California, talked about the eventual Europe shows. There's other shows out on the horizon. I should be coming to Canada this year as well. So that's exciting, as well as some cities in the Midwestern United States that I haven't been. So again, just make sure you're following us on social media so you don't miss any of that stuff. But also speaking of things that you don't want to miss, the new season of Meddling Adults is coming out. Meddling Adults, if you're unaware, is a game show for charity that I run and host where guests compete to solve children's mysteries for charity. They solve cases from Encyclopedia Brown, Scooby-Doo, Nancy Drew, Shelby Wu, and more. And whoever gets the most guesses correct earns money for a charity of their choosing it's very fun it's very wholesome we've got new mysteries in the mix for this season so season four begins on february 1st we're doing a half season five episodes weekly on wednesdays starting february 1st and then we'll take a little bit of a break and we'll do five more episodes towards the end of the year but you can find that at meddlingadults.com or by searching for meddling adults wherever you listen to your podcasts now we're going to have some advertisements play some of these ads will be read by me others of them won't the ones that are not read by me are inserted locally so if you live internationally you might hear an ad in your country's native language, but once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of Potterless. All right, what's good, everybody? <laughs> All right, everybody have a fun intermission. Good, glad to hear it. Okay. So, I'm on pins and needles. <laughs> I do not know who's going to shake this out and win it. Yeah. So first, I had a very fun intermission in that I learned there's stuff wrong with the live stream. Uh, so it was stressful. Mixed reports on if people saw the first 30 minutes or not, or if the first 30 minutes were not just not recorded. So if you're watching at home and you missed the first 30 minutes, hi! <laughs> Hopefully you, from context clues, figured out what's going on. I've also backstage made a quick bit.ly. If you go to bit.ly slash hangrygames, you can see the PowerPoint presentation just in case the screen is not up on the stream for the final little bit here, or if you just want to see the pictures up close and stuff. But yeah, we're going to do the final bit here just in case if you didn't see the first 30 minutes. We're doing Harry Potter Hunger Games, and don't worry, the people aren't dead. They just got magically teleported out, and we're going to keep going. Hooray! <laughs> So who have we lost? We, yeah, oh, that'll be good for anyone who did miss the first 30 minutes. Um, we have lost, or remaining are Harry and Ron, still here. Fred and George, gone. Neville and Luna, still here. Crab and Goyle, gone. Drago and Lucius, gone. Hermione and Ginny, still here. Voldemort and Pettigrew, gone. Dumbledore and Kingsley, still here. Hagrid and Buckbeak, gone. Sirius and Lupin, still here. Lee and McGonagall, gone. McGonagall, am I right? She's not dead. She's also fictional. Dobby and Winky, still here. Arthur and Molly, gone. Okay. That's where we are at. Awesome. Now, because there are only five challenges left, we can remove one die. <laughs> and now we can... <laughs> I like the people like, ooh. Now we can see what the next challenge lies ahead. Okay. Ooh, all right. Mm. So, our competitors... They're feeling weary. They've gone through such intense struggles. Deep breathing, what could possibly be next? Well, the thing that is next is potentially the scariest creature that could ever exist because people hear the sound of explosions and the swoosh of pincers and it's an infestation of blast-ended scroots. <laughs> the coolest name, most terrifying thing ever. I don't know if you've been on the new Hagrid ride in Harry yes. Potter world. Yeah. There may or may not be a blast ended screwed on there during the ride. <laughs> it may or may not be nightmare fuel. The only thing good I'll say about the blast ended screwed, it smells good. Oh, that's good. On that ride, they I, pump I, out I, this like very sweet mm. smell. It's a very weird experience. See, I don't remember because I was too busy going, ah, at the blast ended screwed. It is a very terrifying screw. I think everybody's dead. <laughs> yeah, Hagrid isn't here. Nobody's just, Yeah, Hagrid's not here to control them. They, they are a creature that never should have been born into this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if Draco was here too, that probably would have been a good one to, to go. get him out at? Yeah, that yeah. would have been a good one for him to get absolutely wrecked. I, I feel like Luna's going to be okay. It's Luna still a magical again, creature. We'll be, yeah. it, especially because it sounds like one that shouldn't exist. I feel like the more magical and outlandish they get, the yeah. it's like that's how better prepared Luna is. Like Crumplehorn Snorkax, yeah, sure. Blast ended screwed, that's a thing. So I feel like she'd be okay. Yeah. Again, I feel confident in Dumbledore and Kingsley, powerful wizard. The ones who I'm worried about, because they didn't pay enough attention in class, Harry and Ron. Don't feel very confident in their ability. 
And I, I know that Harry's still like, there were blessed screws in task three, but did he actually fight it or did he just he like, just took I think he just like kind of like corner. ran away from yeah. it, which yeah. isn't a bad strategy, but in the hangry game situation where it's an arena, like how long can you really make do with that? Yeah. And there's only so far that like book knowledge can get you about blessed and screws. Mm-hmm. They seem to be understudied. So there wouldn't yeah. be any books about how to subdue them. So I'm so, worried about the books yeah. district as well. Yeah. Hermione and Ginny. But, but yeah, Ginny is really good at, the hand-to-hand stuff, mm-hmm. and so is Hermione. And yeah, right. I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe. All right, Harry and Ron, Ron, they're undoing. If only they would have paid more attention in class. It wouldn't have done them any good because it was Hagrid's class. But like, he did have blast-ended scroots in did. the class, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but Ron got severely burned, if you'll remember. He did get severely burned. I think that that's... That Even more happens. proof of why they get absolutely <laughs> squashed. <laughs> wow. Wow, so the blast-ended scroots are the undoing. You still have some of your mimosa poured out for Harry. Uh, I'll pour it out into my throat. (laughs) The people here are very nice. I don't want to, like, mess up their floor. Thanks for having me, Cedar Winery. (laughs) Anyway, we continue. We move on to the next thing that takes place. Nope. Nope. Wow. How many times is that going to happen? Well, I've only rolled ones and sixes, which are the only two numbers I can't roll for. Okay, here we go. Now, it's going to be another situation, like when the Games Masters and the Hunger Games use, like, fire to make people go to a particular area. So they lead them out of the forest, and they're in an area where there seem to be a lot of chairs. But, they're you know, they're made out of, like, natural things, so like rocks and, and wood and stumps and all kind of stuff like that. And then in appears a giant blackboard, and down from above slowly floats a very old ghost and he lands down oh no and he says you didn't he says welcome to the history of magic class my name is professor bins and the special challenge here is that whoever falls asleep loses (laughs) so the challenge is don't fall asleep in professor bins's class hermione herfione she's good (laughs) but the other people I don't know. I don't know that paying attention in class was one of the Marauders' strong suits. I was going to say. <laughs> if it wasn't don't Transfiguration, know. which obviously they used to their advantage. Right. And dueling, yeah. I think. Right. History I, of Magic is kind of the class they all slack off on. Mm-hmm. I feel like Winky and Dobby would like weirdly be into it. Like it would be cool for them they to actually kind of be learn from a things. Perspective, that'd be mm-hmm. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dumbledore clearly, if he's hired bins, he either likes bins or has some sort of ulterior motive for bins. The two <laughs> ways Dumbledore hires somebody. <laughs> I feel like yeah, that's a good point. I feel like also Dumbledore and Kingsley could have a way of blocking their ears without being detected. They mm-hmm. know like the higher level spells and right. just like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and Luna, I'm sure, would find it fascinating. Neville's a big old nerd, so he would be fine. I really think the class clowns don't make it out of here. I think Remus and Lupin doze off. They're also older, so they're more likely to fall asleep. Well, <laughs> that checks out, actually. <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah, wow. Defeated by the boring lecture of Professor Bins, the Marauders, as we all predicted. That's why Remus's classes were always so interesting and practical. Oh, yeah. Because he was preventing himself from falling asleep. Yeah. That I, I, always, I, it's exhausting being a werewolf. Yes. It's, and it, it, just all these people hating you all the time for no good reason. Yeah. You just want to teach people things and give well, them I'm, chocolate bars. I'm glad they just got teleported away. Yes, they just got magically poofed away. Yeah, they had the least harm out of everybody. They just got poofed away once they fell asleep. So the and two they got of them a nice fine. nap in. Yeah, love a good nap. They just woke up and they were in the audience and they were like, ah, beans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm really good at rolling ones and sixes. Okay, here we go. <laughs> They're led away from the makeshift classroom that took place and they hear just these big thuds, just thud, thud, thud. Thud. And then they hear a voice saying, you thought everything attacking would be the same, but could I interest you all in a game? And it's a sphinx, and they all have to answer sphinx riddles. <laughs> so the teams all have to answer the riddles three or however many of the sphinx. And if they get them wrong, of course, as we all know, the sphinx just like slaps you or whatever. <laughs> No, you were wrong. Bah! It was a block of ice and it melted. That's how, you know. Can I just say, if I were in the Hangry Games, this is where I would absolutely, if not sooner, uh-huh. the Sphinx Riddle. Yeah. You're not a big riddle guy? Not a big, I'm not a Ravenclaw, despite 
blue. I'm more mm-hmm. of a puff. And uh, who are the Ravenclaws though? Because Luna really, uh, yep, Luna really, really, really knocked it out mm-hmm. of the park when she had to show Harry into the right. room. Yes. So I think that's a good call. She, she's in, in good shape. I also feel like Hermione would be okay because we saw her do a logic puzzle basically in book one. That was her superpower potions. at the end of book one. Right. So I think they would be okay. So it would come down to, mm, man, this is sad. I don't think the house elves would be very good at riddles. I don't think they'd be very good at them. But could they brute force it? Could they uh, use their magic? Nah, I like that. I like. What's funny is this started as like my bullshit game, and now everyone's like, "No, that's against the rules, Eric." <laughs> House of Magic is very special and very unique. I feel no. like they could. If we want to yeah. go not, if we want to go like a different explanation, there. Yeah. What is a riddle if not like an indirect way of getting information? Dumbledore thriving. <laughs> So, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's <laughs> I, just say they're all strong just, candidates. Right. But but and everyone is a little more strong. Sorry to see Winky. I, I will say, and this is fun that it's Father's Day. Shout out to my dad, who when we would be waiting for pizzas to arrive at DiLorenzo's Pizza in Central New Jersey, he would tell us lots of riddles. So we he told me the classic like the twin brothers at the fork in the road. One always tells the truth. One always lies. So shout out to Joel. Those riddles have gone a long way. If a Sphinx ever wanted to attack me, I would be. Just fine. My dad just did those like verbal puzzles, like Pete and repeat. We're sitting on a fence. Pete falls oh, uh, his lap. You say repeat, and he does it again. It's just like, where's the end? It never ends. It's right. a loop. Ah, so fun at parties, your dad. Yes. <laughs> He's known for that, yes. I'm sure your dad's very lovely. <laughs> okay, we're down to the final three. Getting intense. Do, do, so. do. Is there music we can play for the final three? Like, do, 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 It's the do, do, final do. count. But we're going to stop, so don't get okay. sued by Europe. Do, 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 do. All right. Europe is the band, not the country. <laughs> so, let's see. Um, already done that one. Already done that one. Okay. <laughs> this is fun, given who's gone and left. Okay. Again, fire makes people move into a particular area. They come out of the trees, and in the clearing, it's just this big, open area. But at the very end, there appears to be some sort of stage. And on the stage, we see one of the two bands that exists in the wizarding world, <laughs> we see the Weird Sisters. And the Weird Sisters are playing Hop Like a Hippogriff or whatever that one, the one song that they have is. And now that I guess she's eliminated, it could make sense. She could even come back. But what has to happen, our favorite scene from the movies that wasn't actually in the book, everyone has to learn to do the dance from the Yule Ball. <laughs> and it's basically turned into So You Think You Can Dance. We have a panel of judges now. Ooh. Maybe it's like Rita Skeeter. Snape is Simon Cowell. <laughs> and yes, yeah. That tracks, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Howie Mandel is there because he's on every show. Like he's on every game show that exists. He's still there. He's clearly a wizard. So the remaining trio, they all have to do like partner waltz dancing, and whoever does the worst waltz gets eliminated. Who do we think does well in the Yule Ball Dance Challenge? Listen, we know that Neville practiced real yeah. hard mm-hmm. to learn that dance, and you know what he did. Mm-hmm. He did a really good job. And Luna, if anyone in existence ever more embodied dance like nobody's watching than Luna, yeah. I don't think that person exists. Luna would be having a blast. She would be feeling it. Dancing is like 85% confidence anyway. I think they'd be phenomenal. The other two. Hermione doesn't seem like much of a dancer. (laughs) Ginny, maybe, but if we're going movie Ginny, we've seen how awkward she is in partner-based scenarios. Well, movie Ginny's, uh, well, (laughs) actually, that's a good point. (laughs) Um, I feel, yeah, but you know what? Like, they went to the Yule Ball, they were teen girls, they danced it out, they can do the hamburgers like nobody's business. You're right, Hermione danced with Crumb, and you know that Hermione practiced to stuff it in Ron's face. She read it all in a book, those books that have the footprints with little things. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think think that would be very, very good. Here's the thing. Dumbledore and Kingsley both have very long flowing robes. Ooh, <laughs> good point. And you know, that's not great for dancing. You're always stepping yeah. over something like, sorry, headmaster. You know, right. like, oh, sorry, Kingsley. I mean, you know? yeah. No, that's a good point. When I was doing my first dance with Kelly at our wedding, I feel like 90% of my brain was dedicated towards don't step on her. I like you nodding because you've gone through me and this guy. <laughs> it's like, 
It's 90, 90% of it is like, well, I don't want to step on her dress because I know how much the dress costs. And I also don't want to like mess up the dancing. It's also white and my shoes are dirty. So yeah. yeah and also Dumbledore's of... beard is like at least, oh, yeah. at least oh, me yeah. level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now Dumbledore's, Dumbledore's beard Kingsley. is getting tripped on during the, the right. partner's dance. And Dumb- I think, I think they're out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you have to admit Dumbledore's got style, but maybe it didn't translate into dancing. You're right. Okay. We've gotten down yes. to the final two. Let's make the images nice and all big. I mean, not surprised that Ginny and Hermione are in there. Neville and Luna? Yeah, fun. Oh, I didn't drag that diagonally, so that got, <laughs> that went whack. Oh, because I didn't link them? Oh, wow. Uh-oh, let's see. Uh, this yeah, is the very important part. Command, yeah. Oh, you did it, you did it, you did it. Yeah, Matt Lewis's abs are bigger now. Okay. <laughs> This live show is interesting because I have to make sure I'm entertaining for the people here, the people at the stream, and then the people listening afterwards. My brain's in many places. Okay, the final two. There is only one final task, and it is the most terrifying of the ones. So it's funny how this all worked out. How that worked out. This is great. They're already in the big open field. We've got Neville and Luna. We've got Hermione and Ginny. They're getting ready. It's a nice, like, whoever wins, we're happy situation. Both great groups here. Now, the grass starts to like burble and bubble, so they, they kind of run away. And it magically transforms from grass into water. And it's not just water, it's a lake. And it's not just a lake, it's a very ominous lake. And you can see some dark figures within the water. And uh oh, what's this? It's the Inferi Pond from Voldemort's Creepy Cave of Fun in book six. And I would like to imagine, maybe it's like an exact recreation of what you had to do in book six. Like they get trapped on like a tiny little island. There's the big punch of death juice, which I guess is just like vodka. Or no, it's Malort. It's It's just a big pit of Malort. That That checks out. The one time I have had Malort, I was on my knees going, oh, take them, not me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah or no it was the other way around anyway I begged for death <laughs> yeah. that day I begged for death <laughs> so it's a big tub of Malor they gotta do it so they basically have to go through the entire challenge that Dumbledore and Harry went through in book six who do we think would fare better in this challenge to win the hangry games which the ultimate prize is a cute little participation trophy <laughs> that says you did it <laughs> We should arm our contestants. Mm. Oh, this is where the sponsors can come in. So in <laughs> Hunger Games, the sponsors like drop in. Yes, things. little parachutes of stuff. Mm-hmm. So somebody would send Neville the sorting hat. He would pull out of it the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Perfect. So I Love like it, that. but it's not great against Inferi. Yeah, because you need fire, right? Kind of need fire. Kind of need fire. But Luna might have that horn that she has. Oh, the arumpet horn, horn, the ones that can explode. With the explosive. Yeah, I got it. Xenophilius Lovegood uses all of his uh, quibbler money. Yes. <laughs> to, all to, of, it must be there. It's he, a very high selling publication. Mm-hmm. He, <laughs> definitely not a money laundering scheme. He, <laughs> he brings in an arumpet horn. So they have the exploding arumpet horn at their disposal. Okay, and a sword. And a sword. Ginny, I feel like Fred and George could find a way, they would have some sort of, like, pepper imps, right? That's the candy that you can take, and then it, like, blurts out fire. I think that's right. I feel like maybe that's, the, you know, Ron likes candy, Fred and George like a good bit, like a, you know, they love a candy that you oh, eat and then messes yeah, with watching people. on the sidelines, they're like, oh, Ginny, you need these. Right, and so it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Weasley okay. Fund gathers together, and they send them a bunch of, like, hyped-up, souped-up pepper imps, like, super intense, where they're basically, they can breathe fire. Hermione... Do her dentist parents send something? I don't know. Like, who would, Harry could send a gift to Hermione. I love the idea of defeating Inferi by performing dental work on them. Okay. <laughs> here, come here. Because I am terrible. Like, some of that stuff is real. Teleports in. Scary. It's just like that drill. And just like, okay. Oh, okay, a dental drill. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, So yes. Hermione's got a dental drill. Ginny can spit fire. Neville's got the sword of Gryffindor. And Luna has a giant grenade. <laughs> Which you can only use once. Yes, right. Okay, so first off, who do they make drink the death juice out of the two? Neville. Okay, Neville, Neville sacrificed to do the death juice. Oh, that's bad. He's got the way more tragic stuff going on. Yikes. Okay, but I feel like he would take one for the team. And he would and take one for the it. team. His, his liver is probably real strong. Right, can, and uh, can, yeah. 
you know. I feel like Ginny would also take it. She'd be like, look, oh, I've been yeah. through way worse with Fred and George and having to live with Percy Weasley my whole life. <laughs> so I feel like she's gonna, okay. she's gonna be okay. All right, that works. So they're doing it, so that would leave Hermione drilling off the Inferi <laughs> and Luna just getting ready to throw a grenade and then hopefully, you know, get him the water so that the other two can fight. Yeah. Hermione is a very powerful wizard, but she did forget that she was a witch in book one when put in a high stress situation. Doesn't do well under pressure. Doesn't necessarily do well under pressure. Luna and Neville, Neville clearly did very well under pressure. Good he was Neville. he was getting actively negged by Voldemort. Yeah, and he beheaded a giant snake. Yes, pretty good stuff. He's got familiarity with the sword. That feels pretty powerful. Ginny, I do think great under pressure. Good trash talking and stuff like that. But I do think Hermione's a bit of a weak link here. Yeah. Just given her skill set. So I feel like I might give the edge. <laughs> like whoever just went, wow. And I feel like it's Neville and Luna. But what are your thoughts? I think that, first of all, we should have given them more long range weapons. Only <laughs> Luna has the grenade, which kind of like, you don't want to be too close to that when it goes offshore. Mm -hmm. I was thinking... In a really weird occurrence, if this is allowed or if it breaks the rules, you let me know. <laughs> no, the crowd will let you know. <laughs> uh, but Neville, you know, again, very much the hero, very much the Gryffindor hero, would go down swinging. Oh, he would, I like he would, you it. know, his sword really doesn't do much against the dead bodies. They're right. pretty, but it's gonna, you know, he's gonna attract their attention kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not gonna go so far as to suggest he lures them into a, a pile and then, and then throws explode. the- And then At least but, he could kind of try but, to corral Hermione with her dental dress, she is just a sitting target. That's not yeah. really gonna <laughs> do that. I think Neville and Hermione go down. Okay. Oh, all right. Across. And then it's and then it's like because Ginny's there, she's chugging mm -hmm. the pepper imps or whatever and right. spitting fire and like right. spitting fire, flame throwing these guys. Mm -hmm. And Luna, when there's only like, you know, a group of them left, Luna throws the thing. But I think again it might break the rules. But all right. okay. I think those are our two finalists. Okay. Oh, but so. if we have to do one group of finalists, yeah. I think yeah, Luna and Neville would Right. I think probably. I think probably I, I like this scenario. I think we're going to give it to one of the teams because it, yeah. could, it, okay. could, it could be something where like that, it, maybe those two go down, but then, you know, Ginny's going all pepper imp on them and then Luna throws the big explosive and like maybe Ginny gets caught Excellent. fire. Well, like. and the other thing is Ginny's most terrifying weapon is her bat bogey hex. Right. Have you thought about this? What oh. actually happens to somebody like Often. Your, your boogers turn into bats, fly out of your nose, and then attack you. Not fun. Not what fun. What a terrifying all. thing, but I don't Worst. know that it would work on dead people. No. There's not enough like mucus and stuff. Famously, we all know dead people don't have boogers. boogers. <laughs> As we all learn. That's not one of the in things health that, class. It's not one of the things that keeps growing once you die. Right, right, right. right. So, so. Uh, yeah, I think that okay. uh, Ginny would also be kind of depowered. Right. Okay, so we'll just to get the audience in the mix to make sure we've, we're going to make the right call. We'll yeah. turn all over to an audience applause meter, and yep. the streaming audience will try our best to hear. <laughs> it's like Blues Clues, where they like tell you to say something, and you're like, "Yeah," or Bob the Builder's like, "Can we build it?" And you're in the living room, you're like, "Yeah, we can," unless you're like a snarky sixth grader, and you're like, "No, we can't." <laughs> I'm twelve. So if you think that Ginny and Hermione one of the two would fair off and, and win the Hangar Games. Make some noise. Okay, okay. If you think that Neville and Slash or Luna would win, make some noise. All right, and there we have it. The winners of the Hangry Games. Neville and Luna, make some noise. All right. What a fun time. Both very, um, you know, successful kind of underdog stories. Yeah. Really. And and you know what? That's what they love in The Hunger Games. They love the drama. They love the story. They love a rags to riches situation. And that's what we've had here. And that's uh, what we've got there for The Hunger Games. But the show is not over yet because we've got Q&A. Folks have sent in questions. And now I'm going to pull out laptop number two, which is my laptop that's already logged into my email. And we can see what folks have asked 
the two of us. Hello everyone, it's me editing Mike just once more coming in because this is such a long episode. We're gonna take one more little ad break with some of those dynamically inserted ads. I really appreciate everyone understanding what the ads, I gotta make a full-time job out of this and it's an interesting time to be a full-time podcaster. It's always a bit tricky and you gotta do things like this. So I appreciate that you all understand. But again, once these ads are complete, we will get back to this episode of Potterless with a very fun Q&A. Lots of very silly questions up in this one. Okay, uh, just going to pick this first one at random. It's from a longtime listener of the show, Kelly Beckman Schubert. Um, her qu- Your wife? <laughs> yeah, my wife. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> her question, the subject of the email says, live show cue, wife edition. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, Doug and Joel. Doug is Kelly's dad. And all dads, she puts in parentheses. Oh, this is cute. Kelly says, what is your favorite or silliest memory with Joel? And then I guess to to you, what's your favorite slash silliest memory with your dad? Let me actually, I keep a running list on my (laughs) notes app of Ah. funny Schubert family stories to make sure I don't forget any. And I feel like with my dad, yeah, this is a pretty good one. When I was maybe seven, eight-ish years old, maybe even a little younger. I was growing up in New Jersey and we used to go visit my uncle who lived in Massachusetts near mountain areas and stuff. So we would go and go skiing. And my dad was teaching me how to ski and my dad is very good at skiing. And he was teaching me, you know, he like going down the bunny slope, he's going backwards, he's teaching me. And he's trying to teach me the con, you know, the all faded concept, you know, we know of French fry, pizza, et cetera, uh, to know if you wanna go fast, you wanna break, whatever. And my dad is trying to teach me all the different ways that you can go slow and control your speed. And me as a tiny kid is like, dad, I don't wanna go slow. I want to go fast. And the way that I expressed this to my dad is I said, quote, I want to go zooming down the mountain was my refrain that I kept saying to my dad. And he was, you know, trying to teach me to go side to side, to be a little slower, all that kind of stuff like that. While he's trying to teach me this, he tried, he he like has his skis to where I'm not supposed to be able to ski past him. And I just say, screw it. And I just go into like straight French fine mode and tuck. And then I just go over his skis and I go, zooming down the mountain, as I said. And my, my dad turns, and he's told me this after the fact, turns and goes, that little shit. And <laughs> quick hops around, skates down, chases me, and then with his pole just like sweeps my leg out from under me so that I stop, so that I don't just like run into a bunch of people because I'm seven and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I like fall down, of course, I'm seven, my bones are made of rubber, you know, you just bounce up and I'm like, that was fun. So yeah, I think that was a a fun, a fun story uh, with my dad. While you were telling that story, I could picture it crystal clear. (laughs) Even down to the look on your face, like. (laughs) (laughs) I've done it. Yeah. How about you Uh, and your pops? What was the prompt? Favorite? Favorite or silliest memory? Favorite or silliest memory. Okay, a lot of the jokes that my dad tells are NSFW, uh, so I probably okay. can't repeat any of them. They just always were, you know, he's got a fun sense of humor. It's honestly a lot of, um, if I could get sentimental, the little things. My dad, good time guy. Hello, Terry. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, Dad. He really, over the years, has instilled in me a good sense of humor and a good sense of uh, music, and he's just a good time guy. That's awesome. He did the best with the cards he was dealt, and he's good. I talked to him for about 20 minutes this morning before the show. So sweet. Just saying, so it's honestly the little things I couldn't name one big thing. Again, NSFW, but yeah, uh, but, but yeah no, honestly, good guy, and I'm really glad he's my dad. Amazing. Awesome. Look at this heartfelt moment here at the Potterless Show, a podcast well known for its heartfelt moments. <laughs> now, this next email comes from Chloe, where the subject line is Eric is classy AF with his martini. So you're. Uh, oh, that's, that's done. Yeah. <laughs> your mimosa has become hey, I'm a not, martini. I'm less classy now. <laughs> uh oh. I've got mine. Don't worry. Bring okay, it out. Okay. We'll uh, classy together. The question from Chloe is if you had to pick a partner for the Wizarding World Hunger Games, who would you pick and why? So I guess for, for us, if we had to pair with any magical Harry Potter mm. character, who would we? want to team up with I'm trying to think of someone who could like maybe like offset my skills well Hermione's very book smart she's read everything I feel like I could try to offset like I'm done improv comedy for years I feel like I'm quick on my feet she's got more of the research element in it so maybe we could be kind of like the uh you know, more of the planning and more of the not planning kind of like, that's how Kelly and I like tag team traveling. She loves spreadsheets and I love someone else doing spreadsheets. (laughs) So 
<laughs> we kind of thrive where like she does a lot of the planning stuff, and then I'm better at like you know navigating on the spot. So maybe maybe someone very planning heavy like a Hermione would would work out well for me. Who would uh, be your ideal pair? Gosh, there are so many good options. I think Ginny's a, a huge contender. I'm a big Ginny fan just because she's super powerful, super badass, mm -hmm. and I'm a little bit in love with her. Um, <laughs> but if I could go way off the wall, a guy yeah. I want to know, you, you know. Doing the hangry games together, mm -hmm. having a partner, you learn a lot about them and your limits and stuff. And there's a guy who I want to know more about in the Harry Potter series mm -hmm. than we've ever gotten a chance. Uh -huh. And his name is also Eric. He is the security wand weighing guy <laughs> at the Ministry of Magic in book okay. five when Harry goes in for his trial. And Mr. Weasley knows him, so he must be a good guy. If sure, Weasley's sure. like, hey, Eric. Yeah. I read that in the book. Like, oh, hello. <laughs> I, to I you totally too. wanted him to come, but many people are like, why didn't we ever go back to the Department of Mysteries? And I'm like, why didn't we ever go back to Eric's desk? <laughs> Who is this guy? So I think it's a tag team. It's double Eric action. I like it's it. It's me and Eric. Synergy. His, he does have a last name, which I don't think is in the books. I think it's like given to him either in the credits of one of the movies okay. or like extended like EU stuff. Right. Munch. So Eric Munch. Eric, Eric Munch. Skull. Yeah. Okay, all right. It's a double Eric thing. Munch Skull is a Just fun little <laughs> tag team name. <laughs> we're, we're going down in like the third round. <laughs> uh, it's funny, that whole preamble, I thought you were going to talk about Charlie Weasley, and I was like, I should have picked Charlie, Charlie Weasley. Charlie is also, it's a really again, good he's answer. versatile, and like he's more the action sports guy, and I'm like less. But uh -huh. yeah, I think that uh, it would be Eric and Eric, because I want to know more about that guy, and yeah. I feel like if we're in a ring together, we're going to learn more about each other. I like it. That's fun. Okay, yeah. this is a very different question from Annie. Uh, it's from Annie the Ravenclaw and Tia the Ravenclaw, who strongly identifies as a Hufflepuff. So you're like a Ravenclaw in denial. Um, but Annie has suggested doing Mary Fuck Kill with bread, noodles, and rice. They have clarifications here in parentheses. So bread includes pastries, pizza, and then in all caps, all bread. Noodles includes pasta, Asian noodles, and dumplings. And then rice includes just rice. <laughs> okay. Do you want to do, how do you want to do this? Like we each pick let's a each, kill? Let's each pick, we'll start with our Mary. So like, who are you most committed to in the long term? For me, it's rice. I make rice very often with a lot of my meals. If you do brown rice, it's healthy for you. Rice can be versatile where it's like, it's just on the side if you're doing like chicken or veggies or whatever, but also like rice being a part of curry or fried rice. You can have rice with stew on top of it. I feel like it's super versatile and I eat it all of the time. Wow. Okay, I, mean, I definitely, for Mary, I have to go with bread. Okay, I have that's to, it's valid. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can do too many things, Mary. Mm -hmm. You can have donuts, pizza, all the best things. I'd probably go, probably switch to like a gluten-free alternative at a certain point for mm -hmm. health, but but bread is bread is bread. And yeah, I, especially if like tortillas are in the mix, it's a very oh, good call. come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So bread, I'm marrying. Yeah, okay. I'm, uh, this is, uh, damn it, I don't want to kill any this of these. This is a good one. This is a really good one. That is so tricky. All right, so let's go with kill, the one that we were like fine to just like get rid of. I'm killing rice. You're killing rice? Okay, I'm okay. Sorry. Big anti-rice crowd here. Can, there is a huge <laughs> anti-rice crowd here. I can never cook it right. There's always one hard kernel that tastes like plastic. Mm -hmm. I don't have an Instant Pot. I've yeah. never learned. I'm sure I See, can be taught, but if it were right now and I mm -hmm. had to like, I'm determining the fate immediately right yeah. now, Rice has just not served me well, or I haven't treated it yeah. correctly. I think what could change your tune is, it's something that I think it's like criminally underrated when people talk about like, oh, what's the best kitchen appliance? It's like, oh, you definitely need a fridge. Like you definitely need an oven. You know what you definitely need? A rice cooker. Like rice cooker should be way high up there. I remember one of my first roommates was my buddy Edward and he's Asian and he had like the nicest rice cooker ever. And in classic like Asian rice cooker form, it like sang a song when the rice was done. And it's always like a weird song. Like it'll do like Yankee Doodle went to town and you're like, yeah. okay, the rice is ready. Like, my I'm, dishwasher does that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I was at Brandon Google's place and he got like a, rice cooker from Chinatown. And I want to say it did like, it was like a, a patriotic song. Like maybe it did like the Star Spangled Banner or something. Like it was like, why is this the rice is ready song? But I remember pre-living with him, I would struggle with like making rice in a pot or whatever and like always screw it up. And he had a rice cooker and I was like, oh yeah, I've heard about rice cookers. I was like 22. And I was like, what do you do? He's like, you put the rice in, you put the water up to the line and you hit a button. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> So maybe that could change your Yeah, rice. I always get the ratio wrong in the cups right. and the water and the thing. And yeah, you just pour it in, you flip a switch. God, I love my rice cooker. It's great. I'm going to kill bread, which is so hard to do, but I just, I, like, 
it's really just because I can't kill noodles because of the diversity. I am most sad to lose pizza above all else in the bread thing. I'm not like too worried about sandwiches and stuff, but I'm very sad to lose pizza, but I do think I have to get rid of bread. And then I guess I'm just making love to noodles, which is fine. Like it's probably okay. Like in the health department, like for me to be marrying rice, like having rice on the more often, that's good. Just having the flings like every now and then it's like, yeah, like I'll be bad and then get pad thai, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't get pad thai. I always get the more oh, fun thai options. But a good, oh, I don't have the more fun thai options, but the pad thai I love. Yeah. I mean, having really good noodles is like having really good sex. Mm hmm. So it's important. You need I'm it, but maybe not news. sustainable if you have it every single day. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. So <laughs> I think that we we handled that very well. There we go. We've done it. OK, now here is a question from someone who emailed on the live stream coming to you from my couch in the Netherlands is the subject. They've added a phonetic pronunciation for their name. Lykel. I don't know if there's a sound that quite matches the IE sound in English. Maybe legal. Well, Hello, Lykel or Lykel. Thank you for your question. Their question. Now that you've finished The Sea of Monsters and are therefore two books into the Percy Jackson series, if anyone's unaware, I'm doing a Percy Jackson podcast called The Noose Olympian. Woo! I'm very biased, but I think it's very good. Um, they continue. If you'd have to choose between your favorite Harry Potter book, I'm assuming it's six, which it is, and your favorite from the Percy Jackson, one of the first two, which would you rather reread? And then she says, thanks for making it possible for your international fans to enjoy the show. Um, as far as a reread, I think probably at this point I would pick book six of Harry Potter just because I know the full story and rereading, being able to like see some of the seeds planted, I think would be more fun. I do think I'm enjoying the Percy Jackson books more, but <laughs> it's not to say that like I wouldn't enjoy rereading them, but just cause I don't know the full story. I feel like I wouldn't get the best experience out of it. So I think at this point in time, probably I would reread book six. If you had to reread any Harry Potter book right now, what would be your top Harry Potter book to reread? You know, I think that the one I've... Hey, it's me, Cupid. Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and maybe you're trying to think of some cute date ideas where you could also maybe save a buck or two. Well, I've got an idea for you. Why don't you just tell your loved one to come on over to your place? You can light some candles, set the mood, and have a nice romantic evening just sitting and listening to an episode of this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First and foremost, the Europe tour is happening. The prophecy is fulfilled. I've got dates pretty much set in stone for the the most part, I'm in the process of sending deposits and making things 100% official. But as long as everything goes according to plan, these should be the dates. And you can always confirm things if you go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live. When the ticket sales are live, that's when it's 100% legit. So hopefully that will be happening soon. I'm doing Potterless Live. I'm doing the Noose Olympian Live as well. Sometimes it'll be just one podcast as a show, and then I'll be there on back-to-back -back nights. Sometimes it'll be a combo show where one act is the Noose Olympian and one act is Potterless. And some nights it's double bill. You got a TNO show, and then later you got a Potterless show. You can come to both. You can come to one. I'm trying to make as many shows as I can have happen, and this is what the tour routing is looking like. Dublin on March 7th, London March 9th and March 10th, Amsterdam March 13th and March 14th, Copenhagen, two shows in the same night March 19th, Oslo, two shows in the same night March 21st, Helsinki on March 29th and 30th, Berlin on April 2nd, and Munich on April 4th. The Germany dates are currently the most question marky. The other ones, I'm pretty set in those happening. But again, things aren't 100% set in stone, so don't necessarily quote me on it, but just like earmark it if you're considering it. And if you follow Potterless on social media, we're at PotterlessPod on Twitter and at PotterlessPodcast on Instagram. I will, of course, post as many updates as I can, and I might even post something on the feed here once things are 100% official. But that's what we're looking at. I tried to go to as many cities I could in the time that we will be there. I just looked at Potterless download numbers and gave preference to cities where I have the most downloads. So I was just trying to make as many people happy as possible. I hope that you are able to come through. I understand if you're not able to, if I'm not in a city or country near you, I would love to return to Europe and do another tour where I go to places I wasn't able to hit this time around. But I tried to do my best. I tried to spread the love and I tried to go to the places where the most Potterless listeners live. So that's what we've got going on. I'm very excited to make it happen and just follow us on social media and check the website potterlesspodcast.com slash live for when things are official. Now, outside of Europe, we also have US shows. If you live in California, I will be coming your way 
in February. We've got a show in San Diego on February 20th. That's going to be a half Potterless, half the New Olympian show. We've got a two shows, one night situation in Los Angeles on February 21st, where there's an eight o'clock, the New Olympian show and a 10 o'clock Potterless show. And then on February 23rd, I'll be in San Francisco doing a half Potterless, half the New Olympian show. If you want to get to that, you can also go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live, especially for the LA show. You might want to go quickly because tickets are selling quick and the venue isn't huge, but you do get a discount if you buy tickets at both shows. So that's super fun. Now, what's going on in this episode in particular? This is a live show that we did in June of 2022 in Chicago with Eric Skull of MuggleCast. Such a fun show. Absolutely fantastic. We did also stream the show, but something went wrong with the stream where the first 30 minutes or so of the video did not work. If you want to see the remaining minutes of that video, you can go to the Potterless YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Potterless, and you can watch there. It doesn't have the entire thing, so you might want to listen to the first 30 minutes or so of this. But if you wanted to see what the show looked like, even though there's some weird lighting stuff that makes our faces look weird because there was like pink and purple stage lighting, regardless, if you want to see and not just hear the episode, check it out on YouTube. But without further ado, let's get into this episode where Eric Skull and I do the Hangry Games, where we put some Harry Potter characters through the gauntlet of a Battle Royale Hungry Games style tournament live in Chicago. Please welcome to the stage, Mike Schubert from Potterless. I got the juice, I got the juice. I got the juice. Chicago, how's it going? You know it's a good intro when I dance so much that the batteries fly out of the money gun. And only 10% of the pretend dollars fly out. That's how much I love you all. How's it going, everybody? Woo! It is a joy to be back here in Chicago and then also streaming on the internet everywhere. If you're in the live stream, make some noise. Wow, you screamed in your living room. <laughs> so I'm very excited to be back. I was here last summer and it was a very fun time. Let me just say, I've become a changed man since my last time in Chicago, mainly in that I learned that Portillo's is not a Mexican chain called Portillo's <laughs> and they sell hot dogs. And I also have consumed Malort. <laughs> Interesting experience, to say the least. Unfortunately, didn't have any today. Darn. <laughs> Little too early for the brunch show. I don't know if some malort at the crack of noon is a good idea. If you're not from Chicago and you're watching the stream at home and you're like, what's going on? You're best not knowing. <laughs> but I'm very excited to be here on Father's Day. Shout out to my dad, Joel P. Schubert, who I believe is watching at home. And shout out to any other dad, thank you. Shout out to any other dads or anyone that just wants to use this as an excuse. You know, you got a plant. Yeah, you're a plant, dad. Happy Father's Day, you've done it. So today we are going to be doing something very special for the brunch show. We are going to be doing a very important endeavor called the Hangry Games, where I will be joined by a very special guest that I'm about to bring out. And we'll be putting some Harry Potter dynamic duos into a battle royale style tournament. Obviously, I cannot do this alone. I need someone to help me make these tough decisions about who would be eliminated and who will go on to the next round. So please, welcome to the stage, Eric Skull from MuggleCast. Eric, come on out. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I believe you have to turn the mic on. <laughs> Is this real money? <laughs> it is not. It is pretend, but it looks convincing. Isn't that fun? We obviously have mimosas for the brunch show. And they don't have Malort in them. No, they don't. Is that a thing? Like, can you get like a Malortza? I something? would absolutely not. Part of me was like, when I was booking the show, I was like, wouldn't it be fun if I made a Malort mimosa? And then I was like, oh man, then I'd have to buy a whole thing of Malort. That would be a lot. So you have experience with both Harry Potter and the Hunger Games, right? So I've clearly picked the most perfect guest possible. <laughs> yeah, I've read the books and saw the movies and love it. And you've been Harry Potter podcasting for how many years now? Since 2005. Okay, which was 17 years ago. MuggleCast was the first Harry Potter podcast out there. Ooh, and Potterless uh, was not. <laughs> <laughs> that said, it's been an amazing journey in watching new podcasts come and occupy the sphere and 
do amazing things. That's so sweet of you. So, and I'll pay you backstage for yeah, saying yeah. That's such nice no, things. We, we, we've done conventions before. We've we been have. at LeakyCon together, LeakyCon, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, done a few live podcasting panels and stuff. So I was thrilled when you reached out and said, hey, I'm going to be in Chicago. Come be a guest. Well, I'm very excited for this very serious thing that we're doing today. So uh, if we can get the screen projector stuff on and going, then, oh, yeah, here we are. The Hangry Games. Look at us go. I Googled your name and found this photo on Google Images. Yeah. That actually is the promo photo I'm using for live events right now. Let's go. I picked so well. That was lucky. (laughs) That was very lucky. (laughs) So uh, the main reason we've got the presentation here is because we have the teams. Now, if anyone hasn't read the Hunger Games, don't worry, because this is incredibly loosely based on the Hunger Games which Kelly made sure I should point out because when I explained the idea to her last night, she was like, this is so barely The Hunger Games. Okay, so don't worry. But basically, in The Hunger Games, they're in the post-apocalyptic world of Pan Am, and there's all these different districts. They have to compete in this big old tournament to, I don't know, impress rich people. Doesn't really matter. It's a, capitalism's bad. You know, cool, great, the book. Now, we have these teams taking the place of districts. So what I've got here, all of these are dynamic duos or pairings that I've put together and labeled as a dynamic duo. And here are the groups and the districts, because in Hunger Games, they've each got little districts, like ones like they do coal. I'm very impressed. You actually came up with districts for each of these pairings. Yes, and I definitely put lots of thought into it and didn't just think of the first joke that popped into my head. Now, let it be clear that if I am using my phone here, it's because there's certain information about the show that I want to keep a surprise from Eric. I'm not, like, texting while performing. (laughs) Yeah, you built in challenges, and they're going to face, like, Mm -hmm. dangers. It's real cool. Very much like the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. So here are the districts of people, and the visual aid, as you can see, has the teams. Also, these are have no representation for the actual Hunger Game districts, because I don't remember any of them, except for, like... No, I really did. Katniss is from 12, and they make, like, rocks? Did, like, no idea. So, the first district, just going in order, we've got Harry and Ron. They are from the Rock Quarry District because they are as dense as rocks. We have Fred and George from the Practical Joke District. We have Neville and Luna from the Plants and Pets District, a.k.a. the Millennial District. <laughs> we have Crab and Goyle from the Lumber District because they're kind of, you know, big meat bro heads. We've got Draco and Lucius Malfoy from the Luxury Furniture District. We have Hermione and Ginny from the Literature District. We've got Voldemort and Pettigrew from the Theater slash Theatrics District. <laughs> Dumbledore and Kingsley from the Fashion District. Hagrid and Buckbeak from the Produce District, all sorts of food. Sirius and Lupin from the Chocolate District. Lee Jordan and McGonagall from the Sports Equipment District. Dobby and Winky from the Socks District. And Arthur and Molly from the Home Goods District. (laughs) Here are all the photos here. I went with some silly, goofier ones. You know, like, instead of Neville, we've got shirtless Matt Lewis. So, the true representation of all the characters that we all love. We have all of these different districts. They've been put into the tournament. Now, before we get into the actual hecticness of the tournament, what happens, at least in the first Hunger Games book, is there's all of this pageantry and pomp and circumstance to welcome in the different contestants. They do kind of like a fashion show. They do an interview. In the movie, the interview is with Stanley Tucci, which is great. Love the Tucci. Uh, Tucci could not be reached uh, for Couldn't, appearance on yeah. the show. Yeah, unfortunately he was busy with his show where he just goes around Italy and eats food and gets paid money to do it? <laughs> Fuck, I gotta get on that Stanley Tucci money. This is pretty good. But if I just like eat food in Italy and it's like, now you're a TV show. Wow, Stanley, you've done it. I would watch a show that's you doing that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Honestly, the Stanley Tucci show is so good. It's so nice. <laughs> it's really great. They're not paying me to say this. Come on, CNN Plus, which doesn't exist anymore. Pay me money! (laughs) Anyway, they do an interview with that. Obviously, the interview in this case, the person in charge of magical sports and games, we all know him and love him, Ludo Bagman. He does the interviews. He's a great character that definitely mattered in the grand scheme of things in the series. He was very important. Before we get into who we think would do well in the challenge, is there anyone you think would interview well or do well in the pageantry and the fashion show of it all? Well, I'm excited to see what Lucius and Draco pull out with the luxury furniture Mm -hmm. district. That's it's a very important export. I get Instagram ads for couches that I cannot afford all the time. 
But they can afford them. They can afford them, and they make them, and that's the exporting district. Yeah, they would, I feel, do very well in an interview. I feel like Fred and George would do very poorly in the interview because they would just be messing with the interviewers, just like the actual Phelps twins do yeah. during interviews. But they would make a bang. They would very easily buy in, you know, a large group of the crowd would be like, oh, yeah, these guys. These guys are great. Yeah, they'd be fan favorites for sure. Yeah. But maybe not because part of the interviews in The Hunger Games, you have to, like, impress the sponsors and then oh, they send yeah. you gifts and things. Well, you know, like, so Katniss in one of the movies has the dress that catch it, like, literally, literally. catches fire or transforms her into the Mockingjay, mm -hmm. all these other things. Mm -hmm. Well... I bet that Fred and George would have some kind of similar Ooh, visual flair. Very going fun. On. Yes. You know. That's very fun. Especially, uh, you could also have some fun theatrics with the team of Lupin and Sirius. They could turn into their dog oh. slash werewolf forms. Well, Lupin's going to have to be very careful if he does that. <laughs> That's very true. It'd have to be very much <laughs> planned and under wraps. Yeah. I, I think there's some good ones. I think Hagrid and Buckbeak could make a cool entrance. Maybe he flies in on Buckbeak. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. The photo that I've used for Buckbeak, I'm is, <laughs> it's the Buckbeak from the roller coaster, which is terrifying. Not the coaster, but the it. Buckbeak. He's it, like very like, thanks for coming on my ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing this Hagrid, though, flying in on Buckbeak. Yeah. Going, oh, God. <laughs> PlayStation 1 pixelated Hagrid is the one true Hagrid. <laughs> You've definitely gotten to the core of these characters, of these images. Really there. to the soul. So we've got all this going on. The interviews take place. Things are great. But then the actual tournament takes place. So in the Hunger Games, they're in, like, this big outdoor-ish arena. I think, like, they think they're outdoors, but there actually is a roof it's, thing yeah, you learn. Like Spoiler alert, I guess, in terms of Hunger Games, those movies have been out forever. You could have watched it. But what we do here is we've got all of the characters, their teams, they're in, they're getting ready to go. Now, a key difference that we're going to have here versus the Hunger Games. In the Hunger Games, everybody murders each other. We're not going to do that here because I don't think a fun Sunday afternoon for everyone would be an hour and a half of us murdering your favorite Harry Potter characters. <laughs> so instead, we're going to go by Percy Jackson 